part of the Be Wild project funded by Heritage National Lottery. My name is Christina, uh, you're probably sick of me by now, um, but I'm a tutor at the lovely FSC Millport um, with the Field Studies Council. So the Field Studies Council is an environmental education charity that aims to connect everyone with the environment to help them appreciate its benefits and um, also to help them learn how to protect it as well. So this week I've been taking you through a range of sessions to hopefully give you guys some inspiration for how to use your local outdoor spaces for outdoor learning with young people. So whether you are out in the wilderness or whether you're in the middle of the city, and um, hopefully you'll realise now that the outdoors is still a fantastic location for learning with young people. But not only that, it's also good for you know increasing their you know personal development and their growth. It's good for increasing their confidence, and um, also of course it's fantastic just for a bit of good old fashioned fun as well. And particularly in these strange circumstances that we find ourselves in, there really is no better time to get your young people outdoors and appreciating their local spaces. So each session has an overall theme and that's, that's then been jam packed full of different activities and session ideas. You know, there's been tools and resources um, to help you facilitate your outdoor learning. And we've also discussed ways that you can adapt the sessions to suit different age groups or different environments. Um, and we've also been discussing health and safety in group management as well. So um, we've had a whole range of different sessions um, if, don't worry if you haven't managed, managed to tune into all of them and um, they will all be available on YouTube for a good few weeks yet. Uh, on Monday we looked at Marvellous Mammals, um, on Tuesday we looked at the world on our doorstep, on Wednesday we were hunting for mini beasts, yesterday we were down at the rocky shore and today in our final session we are looking at bushcraft and wilderness skills in the outdoors. Um, so lots of things done and um, hopefully you've already got loads of ideas for how you want to use these sessions with your young people. Um, how each session will work is you'll have this live introduction from me where I'll be kind of setting the scene and um, we'll then be introducing the main video with all the session ideas and we'll then be bringing you back live back to me where I'll be answering some of your questions. So if you have any questions you would like me to answer at the end of this video you can either pop them into the little chat box um, on the YouTube page or you can email them over to us and the email address is questions at field-studies-council.org. Um, so feel free to ask any questions, so they can be about this session, or if you've got any questions from any of the previous sessions, it's your last chance to have them live answered. So please don't be shy, please feel free to email those on. And um, you know, the chances are, if you're not sure about something, chances are someone else isn't either. Um, so do feel, do feel free, excuse me, um, to email those on. Uh, but let's get started with our final session, um, Bushcraft in the Outdoors. So what we're going to be looking at in this session is a range of different activities you can use with young people to help them develop their outdoor survival skills. Um, so we're going to start off first of all by looking at foraging. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of the plants that are really common around our areas and um, that you can use for foraging that you might be able to eat outside, you might be able to cook them or they might have other purposes as well. Um, and we're also going to discuss of course how you can safely go about foraging um, and how you can safely cook them with young people. Uh, we're then going to look at a key uh, survival skill, fire lighting. So we're going to be looking at how you might do a session around fire lighting with your young people in a local space. Um, but of course, talking about health and safety as we go. We're then going to move on and look at cooking over the fire. So once you've got a fire going, of course, you don't want to just let it go. Uh, you want to cook something over it. So we're going to look at some uh, snacks and things that you can do over the fire and also some hot drinks as well. And then we're going to round up with a little bit of discussion for extension activities for things you might want to do as well as these activities with your young people. So looking at things like arts and shelter building. Um, so lots of things to get done. Um, we really have left the best till last. Bushcraft is fantastic for young people. It's very often our, uh, our young people who come to visit the centre and um, their favourite activity. So first of all, let's have a think about where bushcraft comes from. So bushcraft comes from Australia. Um, now the wilderness, of course, out in Australia is incredibly vast and often quite harsh. Um, and is often simply referred to just as the bush. Um, so the people that live there have to develop these essential skills for survival and how to live off the land. Um, so they had to learn how to you know, forage for food, how to catch their own food, and they had to learn how to build shelters, they had to learn how to clean them, and then how to medicines as well. A whole range of different skills um, that we can do and to help them connect with that. So today, bushcraft is an amazing way to connect young people with their local outdoor spaces increase their confidence, increase their resilience, um, but also bring in really interesting discussions about sustainability as well. So today we're often quite disconnected um, with where our possessions come from, you know, whether it's the food on our plate, whether it's clothes on our backs, um, you know, we, we kind of are missing that second point. We don't quite know the processes that go into making these items, and we often don't know where they come from as well. 
So by giving these skills to young people, by giving them the skills to obtain these things for themselves, it really does open the door for some really interesting discussions about how they can, you know, better the environment and by being better consumers. And we have some fantastic discussions by young people just very much about that um, here at the centre. And the beauty is they really can be done anywhere as well, regardless of where you are, any of these skills can be developed. So if you've tuned into any of the other sessions, you'll know that I felt like a quiz um, at this stage in the video. And um, so I've got one final quiz um, for you guys about our foraging skills in particular. This quiz is called, what is it and can I eat it? So I'm gonna be showing you um, a series of pictures of different plants um, that are very common around all parts of Scotland. Um, and you have to try and identify if they're edible or not, okay? So I'll show the photos for about 10 seconds or so, and then I'll flip around and reveal the answer. Um, if you've been keeping a tally as the week goes along, of your this is your final chance to, you know, excel yourself. Um, so here we go. Here is gorse, big lovely yellow flower, smells of coconut. It is not really edible. However, you can use the flowers, you can actually add them um, to alcohol for fermentation. Um, and it's quite a common thing, um, I think particularly in, um, for Danish beer. There we have it. Next one here, hopefully one everyone is familiar with. Eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. So this is, of course, the common nettle, and it is edible. So some of you might have already had a uh, nettle tea, nettle soup, you might have added it to stews and things. It is very edible and actually very, very good for you as well. And supposedly has more iron in it than spinach. And um, so that is a common nettle. Next, we have oh, there is a portrait one. Yes, right, here we go. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so this is foxglove. And this is not edible. This is in fact poisonous. This is definitely one you want to appreciate from a distance, uh, but not use in foraging at all. Okay. Next we have, oops, upside down. Here we are. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One. So this is bramble, and this is of course edible, one of the best wild foods that you can eat. And we're just about coming into bramble season now, um, which is fantastic. So that is bramble. And our very last one. Sorry, the wind has picked up a little bit. Hopefully everyone can still hear me okay. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one. So I'm sure everyone knows what this plant is. It is, of course, the dandelion, um, but it is edible, believe it or not, as you'll find out in a little bit more detail um, in this next video. Uh, so, hopefully you got on with that okay. And um, this really nicely introduces now onto our main video. Um, so in a moment, the video will start playing. This one's a little bit longer than our previous video. So this one is about 40 minutes long now. Um, and that's just because there's quite a lot of health and safety to cover, of course, when you're talking about eating things out in the wild and, of course, lighting fires as well. Um, but after that video, you'll be then brought back to me live where I'll be answering some of your questions um, and kind of rounding everything up. Um, so uh, the video will start playing in just a moment. Hopefully you enjoy. Thank you very much. Oh, 
foraging is a really key bushcraft skill that is really rewarding to bring into any outdoor learning session with young people. Plant ID can feel like a quite challenging topic to get into, particularly if you're a beginner. But what you'll soon learn is that actually many a really, really common species of plant that we can identify really easily are edible and can be used in a bushcraft session. Now, there are some species of plant in the UK that are potentially damaging and poisonous to eat or, you know, damaging to touch. However, we're going to really drive home the fact that the key thing with foraging in the outdoors is do not pick something if you are not 100% confident that it's the species that you think it is. Spring and summer are definitely the best times of year to forage, but you can find things in the winter time as well. Really be sure to look closely at your local space because you will guarantee you find as loads and loads of different things um, to eat and to use for an outdoor uh, bushcraft session. Our uh, grassy verge that runs along a pavement just opposite our centre, we can find brambles and mint and sorrel and elderflower and all these different things that are just ready for the picking um, to be used with outdoor learning. So there is a kind of simple process to go through when it comes to trying to identify a plant. It doesn't need to be complicated. The first thing to consider is the size of the plant itself. Is it tall? Is it high? You know, what sort of size is it? Is it a bush? Is it an individual flat plant? And then once you've considered that, you can then move on to... You can then move on to looking at the leaves themselves and looking at the features of the leaves. So what size are they? What shape are they? What colour are they? Do they have serrations along their edges or are they smooth? Do they have any particular features like veins um, that make them really prominent? Um, and once you've considered the leaves, you can then look to see if it has any flowers and you can look at the flowers themselves. What colour are they? How many petals are they? How many flowers are they on the, on the plant itself? And it does, once you get a little bit of practice in, it does become nice and straightforward. FSC has produced a huge range of guides to IDing plants that are available to purchase online, but the most useful one for any bushcraft or outdoor kind of eating um, is the top 25 edible plants in the UK. Um, so it shows you which ones are best to look for, what times of year to look for them, and also a few key ones to avoid. So now we're going to look at a few examples of really, really common, easy to find plants that you can eat right there out in the wild. And we're also going to talk about kind of key things as to how to pick them and how to safely consume them um, outside. The key things to remember is that you want to try and pick your plants from as high up, as far away from a road or a path as possible, because that just reduces the risk of contamination. And again, the key thing really is do not eat anything unless you're 100% confident what it is. So the first species we're going to look at are brambles. They are probably the most delicious type of wild food I think that you can eat out um, in Scotland and also they're quite a nice one to start off with because there's not very many plants that you'll confuse them with along the line. They're an incredibly common and prolific plant and you'll find them all over the place in hedges and verges and parks and woodland all over the place and they do grow very very quickly so the chances are if you find a small patch there's probably going to be more in the area as well. So this is one huge big bramble patch that we have in our uh, just opposite our centre but we have them all along the road as well. So by the time the plant is old enough to be able to produce berries, it'll be a really quite tall, quite bush-like um, plant. Um, so you can see this here, it's probably just about the same height as me. You will get them shorter and you will get them taller as well. The key things to look for is the leaves are a kind of dark green, but they also kind of have a distinct kind of purpley tinge to them. And they're almost a, a nice little, uh, sort of wide round shape with a little point and they've got serrations as well. And of course, the key thing that I'm sure we all know with brambles is that their stems or their stalks are very, very pointed. Now, the actually cool thing to do with brambles that you can also do as well as eat the, the berries is that the insides of the stalks have a really hard cord that in the past was used to weave into baskets and things. Um, so if you're looking for a little bit of an expansion activity as well as eating the berries, um, you can look into the stems as well and look at ways to make things with, um, with the inner cord. Now, the berries themselves will be sort of a, almost like a dark raspberry, a really, really dark sort of purple colour, almost black in appearance. But where raspberries have that hollow centre, brambles are just full all the way through. 
Now, we don't have any examples at the moment on the bush because the best time for harvesting brambles is kind of in the late summer, normally from about August, normally to September, sometimes even October if you had a particularly summery or sunny um, autumn period. And they are absolutely delicious. Now, pick them from the top because they're the ones that will be um, have the most light and be furthest away from the path where, you know, dogs might have had access to them or other mammals. Um, and you can eat them just straight off the, off the bush, although of course you can wash them if you like. But as well as eating them straight away, you can make them um, into recipes as well. So you can boil them up and make jam, or you can add them to things like crumbles as well. So if you want to bring a little bit of what, you know, if you want to bring a little bit of the outdoors into the indoors, um, you can bring them in and do a little bit of cooking there. So our next species that we're going to look at that is probably one of our most common plant species in the UK that everyone will be familiar with is the dandelion. Now they are pretty notorious and um, they get heavily persecuted for being a weed um, and being really prolific um, but they are an incredibly important species for our pollinators, our bees and butterflies and they're also potentially a really useful food source if you were stuck out in the wild somewhere. So there are a few key things to look for when it comes to identifying dandelions. The first thing of course is this lovely bright yellow flower. Um, but they don't have that at all, like, all throughout the year. So the second thing you can look to are the leaves. So the way they get their name is dandelion is French for don de leon, so like lion's teeth. And you can see quite clearly how they get that name from the leaves there. So big, big, jagged um, points there on the leaves and they're quite long and thin. So almost kind of like a sort of Christmas tree kind of thing there. Um, so you can look for those leaves. And then the final thing is, of course, that big puffy seed head um, that everyone likes to blow and, you know, disperse the seeds. So those are the three things to look for when it comes to dandelions. Now, in terms of how you can eat them, the leaves themselves can actually be used in the same way as you would spinach or lettuce. They can be picked fresh, washed and then put into things like salads. Um, you really want to try and get the new leaves. So if you can see this one here, it's looking a little bit tired. It's clearly been out for a little while. So this wouldn't be the best, but really fresh, kind of bright green young leaves. Um, those ones are the best to go and you can just eat them as you are or as they are. The other thing that you can do, which is really interesting with dandelions, is to use the flowers. So you can boil the flowers down and you can make a sugar syrup out of them, like honey. And then you can use them exactly how you would use honey. So again, another really cool way to kind of bring the outdoors in. So our last example that we're going to look at is one that is not as easy to identify and not as prominent, but is absolutely worth the effort to learn it. So this is called common sorrel. So it's a quite short plant and um, it'll grow really commonly in meadows and playing fields and parks and things like that, just in amongst the grass. Um, and when you eat it, it tastes like apple skin when you chew it up between your teeth. Absolutely fantastic. Um, it's just a bit of a harder one to find sometimes. And because it grows really close to the ground, normally we would always recommend giving it a little bit of a wash before you eat it. Now the key features to look for is it's normally a, it can grow to this size, it can grow a little bit bigger or a bit smaller, but it's a, a long sort of green, bright green uh, leaf. It has smooth edges, um, but the key thing to look for is if at the bottom you see it has quite a prominent V. It ends in these two points and there's this little kind of upside down V at the bottom of the leaf. And that's the most important thing to look for. That is the absolute definitive proof that this is common sorrel that you are looking at. So as I said, it is a little bit trickier to identify than things like brambles or dandelions, but it's absolutely an amazing one to use with young groups and to teach them how to identify it themselves. Because when you rip it up and then chew it between your teeth, Granny Smith apple, absolutely there's no flavour like it, Granny Smith apple. Now the one thing to bear in mind with sorrel is that if you eat it in ridiculous quantities, like really, really high quantities, it'll give you an upset stomach, but you would have to consume like an entire bowl of it. It's one of these things. It's lovely just to find a little patch of it, have a little nibble on it, maybe as you're going for a walk or going through a location, um, and then have a little nibble of it and then move along.
So those are just three common species that you will find commonly in any park or grassy verge or anywhere around the country, but you never quite know what you could find in your local area. And there are so many plants out there and that could really kind of add to an outdoor learning session. And again, if you want to kind of make it even more rewarding for the students themselves, they can have the challenge to identify and find the plants themselves because it adds so much more value when it's them taking kind of control of their own learning. Um, there's loads of ID, ID guides out there online, um, particularly the FSC one is really, really good. Um, and there's lots of information as well where you can find out sort of health benefits of the different plants and other uses that they would have had, you know, in kind of previous times where people maybe didn't have all the facilities that they have today. So things like our cord for our brambles or string that can be made from nettles. So one way that we have turned foraging into an activity is by making it into a game that we call Plant Bingo. So we've made up some cards. On one side of the card there are some pictures of a particular plant that we know is in the area and on the other side are some facts. So essentially along a walk the students get different cards given out to them and they have to try and find the plant along the walk. When they find it they shout bingo and then we all gather around that plant and they tell us some of the facts that they've learned from the back of the card. So as well as foraging, another really key bushcraft skill that young people can develop that's really, really fulfilling is learning how to light a fire out in the wilderness. Now, as group leaders, it is really important for us to be aware of the hazards, you know, of this sort of session and to take as many precautions as possible to avoid any risk um, from those hazards. However, don't be put off by, you know, the th thought of an open fire with young people. It is, you know, an incredibly fulfilling experience to have um, with your young people. And for them, it's an amazing way for them to develop teamwork skills um, and as well a bit of resilience. Um, so we're going to talk quite a lot about how we might manage a group and things to think about in terms of health and safety for running this sort of session to hopefully make you guys feel a little bit more confident. So choosing a good site to do a fire lighting activity is really, really important um, because a safe site means for a safe experience. So things you kind of want to consider, first of all, think about the level of shelter that you get from your site. Um, high winds can be the biggest issue or biggest hazard in terms of weather when it comes to fire lighting because of course a strong wind will blow flames in any which direction. Um, shelter you can get from a site can be a whole range of different things. You know, you can use trees and vegetation. So you can see we've got a nice tall tree behind me and we've got some tall vegetation around the side. Um, as long as it's not overhanging and it's not kind of adding debris to the ground, that can still be you know, a really good shelter and barrier um, from high winds. Um, as long as, of course, there's no risk of that becoming, you know, the shelter becoming inflamed itself. But as long as you keep a good distance back from it and as long as it's not overhanging, there's not really a risk of that. Other things you can use could be, you know, walls um, and any rock formations, um, anything at all that prov uh, provides a natural boundary between the wind and your fire. The other things to consider are the size of your site as well. So you want a, a fairly big site to be able to allow any groups that are doing fire lighting to be able to spread out so you've not got any fires, you know, happening next to each other. But equally, you don't want it to be too big that they get so spread out that you can't keep an eye on the fires and also jump in and kind of help if anything was to get out of control and put out the fire. So you want something that is fairly wide space and it depends again on the size of your group that you're working with, um, but something that's not too big, but not too small as well. And we've got a diagram to kind of show you the things to consider. The last thing to consider with your site is whether it's privately owned or not. So the Scottish Outdoor Access Code does allow small open fires to be built as long as they're done responsibly and safely. But if your land that you want to use is privately owned, you might need to ask for the permission of the landowner before you can go lighting fires there. So moving away from thinking about just the site itself, thinking about things that you might want to have with you um, for a fire lighting session. The first and most important thing that you always want to make sure you have with you is plenty of water. So as you can see here, we've got some water that we've just collected from um, just the coast just down uh, across the road here. Um, but we've also got a, a, buck, a bottle of water. Now that's ideally for drinking and later on making some hot drinks. Um, but we have plenty of water available in the case of an emergency. Because if you have any issues during your fire lighting site, whether they're behavioural from your young people or whether they are something external that's happened, if you've got some lit fires going on, that immediately adds a whole extra layer of 
complexity to an issue. And you have to really just control what you can control. If you ever have any issue that's going on, you need to be able to immediately put out that fire and just take away that hazard, take away that risk. So always ensure to have water readily available um, just in case of any issues arising and then you can immediately just get rid of it and take away that risk. The other things to consider that you might want to have along with you, fire resistant gloves um, can be a good thing to bring along and you also might want to consider things you might carry in your first aid kit that you might not ordinarily carry, things like cold packs um, or you know, heat, uh, burn, burn plasters or burn bandages could be a handy thing just to have in the worst case scenario. So before you can go about actually lighting any fires, you first of all need to collect your fuel. And this is an important activity for the young people to go through because they're doing the whole thing from start to finish. They see the raw material of that fuel and then eventually later on they'll see it turned into you know, a fire that they could potentially cook and do things on. So we tend to recommend three different sizes of wood, normally going up in kind of size order by diameter. So to start off with, and actually the most important size of your wood um, should be incredibly thin. So we are kind of recommending pencil lead thickness really um, for the first size of wood. And this is going to be your kindling. This is going to be the most important thing because once you get a spark going, that is what will catch and allow your fire to grow. So plenty of those. You then want to take it up a little bit and maybe look for sticks that are maybe sort of pencil thickness. Um, so that's the ones those kindling bits have caught, those first really thin ones, this is then what's going to help um, you know the rest of your fire to catch. And then last but not least, the thickest that we tend to go for, and this is, we're talking little fires here, we tend to go for maybe board marker, width of your thumb, that sort of thickness. Um, that's as thick as we go. We don't want anything forearm size. We're not building a campfire. Um, so that is as thick as we would go for one of these small open fires. But these three things, these three sizes are all very important. The other things to consider with the fuel that you're collecting is you want to make sure it's as dry as possible. It can be quite a challenge in Scotland, we get, we understand, um, but try and collect it from you know sheltered positions if it's underneath trees or things like that. The other thing you can do if you're super organised and you know you want to do a fire lighting session with your group, you can get them to collect the wood in advance, they can then dry it out inside for a little bit and then use your fire lighting on a different day. The other thing we want to consider is that we don't want to take any twigs or any sticks that are alive and we don't want to damage any alive um, trees to get the, that fuel and that's for two reasons. We don't want to damage the habitat um, but also live you know, living trees, living sticks will have loads of water inside them so they're not going to burn very well as well. Also along the lines of looking after the habitat and looking after the area that we might be doing fire lighting sites in, we um, tend to use metal trays and that's what we build our fires on. So they can be old baking trays, cooking trays, whatever you have to hand. And we raise them up off the ground. So we put stones underneath and then put the trays nice and stably on top. Um, and that just means the ground underneath is going to be undamaged, unharmed, and it allows air to circulate. And then we can use this same site again and again without damaging it or leaving any trace. So the three things a fire needs to light are fuel, a spark, and oxygen. So we first of all, we have our fuel and we need to set out a structure um, using our fuel before we do any lighting to ensure that there's going to be plenty of oxygen get into our fire because if you just pile stick on stick on stick there's gonna be no oxygen and you won't get a successful fire going so there's loads of different structures you can build and um, when you are you know starting off a fire and um, we tend to go for sort of a square sort of tower sort of structure so you place your four sticks down four of your biggest sticks in this sort of square formation like so and you want to keep doing that. Now it'll depend on the size of your sticks, but you kind of want to keep doing that until it is maybe sort of five, five centimeters off the ground, okay? And as you can see there, we've got some gaps underneath um, and that's just going to allow oxygen to keep flowing. And because these are some of the biggest sticks that we have, they will burn much more slowly. So it will keep and retain that structure. Once we have our structure built, it's time to consider other things like our spark. So we're going to give ourselves a little bit of a helping hand with getting our wood lit. And we're going to use a natural material. Um, we're going to use cotton wool. So we take a little dod of cotton wool and we want to tease it out. So we want to kind of sort of pull apart, but not quite. And this just increases the surface area um, of the cotton wool. And again, allows just more oxygen um, to get to that fire. 
So once we've teased it out a little bit, now you can use cotton wool, particularly for younger students um, or people that have never done it before. Cotton wool is a really good helping hand. To differentiate a little bit, to make it a bit more difficult for some students, you could use completely natural materials that you find. You could use things like cotton grass or you could use seed heads from thistles particularly, um, but this is always a good place to start. Now, another little handy little hint to give you uh, an even better chance of getting a good fire, we add a dod of petroleum jelly to our cotton wool. Because petroleum jelly or Vaseline is just very flammable. So what it does is it helps the cotton wool burn just for that little bit longer so it gives you more time to get your sticks lit. So you can just do a little dod on your finger and pop it on the cotton wool. Now a safety concern to bear in mind obviously with the use of the Vaseline is that it is flammable so particularly for young students you don't want them dunking their hands in it and smearing all over themselves. So with young students one of the methods I use I always just make sure that I'm the only person or my helpers are the only people who put their hands into the petroleum jelly and that just means we can ensure that nobody else has got it on their hands when it comes to lighting the fire. Now, we're just about ready to, ready to light our fire, but there's still quite a few key safety points that we need to consider. First of all, it's down to the individual who is around the fire. They need to think about where they are in relation to the fire and also into the wind, because absolutely you, the last place you want to be standing when you have a lit fire is downwind, because the fire flames will actually be blowing towards you, but also all the smoke will also be blowing towards you, potentially getting your eyes, which could be really, really sore and potentially damaging. So you always want to make sure that you are uh, crouching upwind from your fire, and it's the same for all the young people as well. The other thing to consider is the way that you are um, sort of sitting or, or crouched next to your fire. The last, you don't want to be sitting, you do not want to be sitting on your bum because if something changes, if the fire you know, changes direction, if the wind changes, if you're sat on your bum, you can't really get out of the way very quickly. So kneeling is fine, kneeling is okay because you can still kind of move yourself backwards. But the best position to be in is sort of a kneeling crouch like this. So sort of one foot up, one knee down, because if anything changes direction, you can very quickly stand up, move away, move to the side, and you've got full control over your location around that fire. So other things to consider are of course clothing and things like long hair. So if you're doing this in the middle of winter, everyone's obviously going to be in jackets and things, which is fine. Um, but you just need to make sure any dangly bits from jackets are tucked away and particularly things like scarves um, need to also be tucked away. Long hair is absolutely something to consider. Um, so every long, everyone with long hair should have it tied back. But especially if you've got um, someone with really, really long hair, even tying it back in a ponytail might not always be the right thing because that dunking end of the ponytail might still be a hazard. So either tie it back in a bun, a pleat, just make sure um, that hair is particularly out the way. Okay, so once all your young people understand all the rules, all the, all the health and safety that um, they have to adhere to, you are ready to light your fire. And what we're going to use is again sort of the same resources that people back in the day would have had when they discovered fire. We're going to be using flint and steel. So steel is of course a type of metal, so this is the, the part of the steel here, and flint is a type of stone. And when the two are rubbed together, it generates so much friction that you get a really big spark. And that is what we can use, that is our final spark on our triangle and um, that will allow us to light our fire. Now these are a really really good bit of kit and they're fantastic for young kids or, and old kids as well um, to have a go at using. They can be purchased really cheaply online, you can get like a packet of two for five quid off Amazon, um, so yeah, they're definitely worth the investment. Um, the things to be careful of obviously with these when people are practicing using them is they shouldn't be you know, doing sparks up into the air, towards anyone, anything like that at all. If anyone's going to be practicing sparks, it needs to be facing downwards, away from them, towards the ground or towards the fire that they're trying to lit. Now they do take a bit of practice to use, you know, they require a fair bit of strength and a fair bit of speed, um, but really groups of all ages can use them. Um, and this is where differentiation comes in really nicely to this fire lighting activity, because you can really take it in stages and you can allow the students to have 
you know, their own objectives, their own things that they want to gain from it. You know, they might just want to be able to get some sparks. They might want to light the cotton wool. They might be able to, you know, they might want to build a whole fire themselves. But it's a really nice one that you can work on with students potentially for a long period of time and slowly build up those skills and again, give them control for their own learning. So I'll just give you a little demonstration um, of the best way to use these. So for these ones that we've got here, we've got kind of a, a rounded top to our steel, um, but we do also have a, a smooth blade as well that you can use, and it really is personal preference, whatever you find easiest. So if you're using the rounded blade, you want to start off with the rounded bit at the top of the flint. Now this way is always kind of like a wrist flicking motion sort of thing, so you really want to get that flick of the wrist there. Um, and you want to sort of bring it down, hold it nice and firmly, and then, oh, try flipping it around. There we go. So you want to strike it down all the way along the flint using a decent amount of force. If you don't like that way, you can try the smooth way. I tend to prefer the other way. And you can, there we go, strike it down like that. Okay, so we're going to have a little go at demonstrating how we light our fire. So once I've got my cotton wool lit, I'll be taking my kindling, my smaller sticks, and putting them over the top of my tower, and then it'll be a simple case of once those have started to burn, I'll start adding on bigger sticks. So, fingers crossed. I'll be editing this slightly. <laughs> there we go. So one thing I always always recommend is to not do really for young people in particular is to blow on the fire. It seems to be one of these things that's in TV all the time and they're just determined to blow it as much as possible. Um, but from my experience, it kind of just it just adds more complications. Um, you know, blowing on the fire can help. It does create that little bit of extra oxygen. Um, but I think with young people, it's for, for especially young people, it just brings in too many risks because they might just blow the ash into people's eyes. So I would tend to recommend uh, not blowing on the fire. So we're now going to move on from simply lighting a fire to thinking about how we might go about cooking over a fire, which as you can imagine is incredibly fulfilling for young people and older people as well. Um, so what we're going to look at is a few like snacks and drinks that you could potentially make with minimal equipment um, and how you might adapt them to you know slightly different dietary requirements and things like that. So for all the snacks that we're going to look at, all you really need to be able to cook them is some form of skewer. So we have metal skewers that we use again and again just because we do quite a lot of cooking over the fire. Um, and you can get these online again for not very much money. However, you can also just use you know, sticks um, as skewers as well. You can dampen them to make sure um, that they aren't going to burn and also you can clean them as well to make sure that they're not contaminated by anything. Um, so some form of skewer is ideal and then of course Everyone's favourite thing to have over a fire is, of course, a toasted marshmallow. And these really are amazing, no matter how old you are. So the good thing with marshmallows is you can get vegetarian alternatives these days. So they can pretty much be suited to all diets. So all you need to do, one on the end of your skewer, and then hold it at the very top of the flame or over hot coals, and slowly toast it on each side for a few minutes and that will be ready very, very quickly. And that provides a good snack for all involved. So one other thing you can do, particularly for older students, if you want to move beyond marshmallows, is you can make up a dough called dampener bread. So this is a really, really simple dough to make up. You can do it sweet or savoury. We tend to use flour, sugar, and a little bit of water to make up the dough. But you could add extras, you could add cinnamon and chocolate chips, or you can make it savoury, you know, and add salt and pepper, and maybe a chosen herb that you foraged, you know, on your way to your fire lighting site. So you should get a dough-like consistency, kind of like this. Take out a little small bowl of it, a small ball of it, sorry. Roll it amongst your hands. Now, of course, if you're doing this out in the wild, you do have to consider things like hand sanitizer and washing hands before you're obviously touching um, the dough. 
once you've got it into a ball, roll it to a thin sausage. The thinner the, the sausage is, the quicker it'll cook. So roll it out nice and thin, something a little bit like that. And then take your skewer and wrap it around your skewer in a sort of spiral like that. Now these two take much longer to cook than marshmallows. You kind of want to do them for five minutes on each side. But all you have to do is rest it at the top of the flame for about five minutes or so until it kind of goes brown on the outside. And then once it's done, you flip it over. Okay, well that is certainly the top part of our Dabna bread nice and ready now. Um, you will need to be careful if you do use metal skewers yourselves. Obviously the skewers are going to be very hot if you're having done any cooking on them, particularly with young students, they need to be very careful around them. Um, so the key thing to do is just kind of, you know, blow on anything that's just been in the fire. Um, don't waggle it around, of course. Um, and then with your fingers, you can just take a little bit off. Just adding that little bit of sugar just kind of makes it like a, a freshly made donut really really good so those are some good examples of a few snacks that you can cook over the fire but if you want a drink to go with them and um, there's a few options you've got so these camping kettles are perfect for use on um, little fires like well, the ones we've made. You just need to fill them up with some fresh water and then once you've got a pretty decent fire going, so you're burning probably the, the, you know, the biggest of your sticks, and once it's nice and stable, you can just go ahead and place that flat onto your fire. Now you will need to keep an eye on the fire because this is where your structure becomes really important because if you just put that kettle on and it completely flattens it, you'll still not get that oxygen and the fire will go out. So as you can see here, our structures come into play here. So we've got plenty of air still circulating around and plenty of flames still going. So that'll uh, boil nice and quickly and then we can make ourselves a hot drink. So once you've got your water boiled, you can then steep whatever you want to make a hot drink um, in your hot water. So again, it really adds that extra level of excitement if you uh, use something that you've collected along your way. So that could be wild mint or it could be nettles to make a nettle tea. Um, and you just leave those in the water to steep for a little while and then you can just drink them out of plastic cups or whatever you've brought with you. Um, the other things you can do, of course, if you've put them some tea bags in your pocket, bring them along or some squash or even some hot chocolate, um, it can be a really, really nice experience to share with your young people. So when it comes time that you've finished lighting your fires, you've finished doing all of your cooking, you just have to completely douse your fire in water. So really don't take anything for granted. I just, just douse it completely until it is completely gone because absolutely you don't want any risk of that fire coming back to life at any point. Um, so douse it in water, then leave it to the side for a little minute to cool down just because that tray will be hot um, and then that is you all finish your fire. It's completely out and you can pour that water and those soaking wet sticks um, you know, back into a, an area of bush or you know, back into you know, some water where you collected your water from originally if you collected it from a natural source. Um, but just pop it away somewhere underneath the bush where it'll naturally decompose and then that means you're leaving no trace of the area where you've done your fire lighting. Another. Another way you can do a little bit of cooking outdoors but avoids the need for an open fire is by using something called a Kelly kettle. So this is a Kelly kettle here. Normally comes in a nice easy bag to carry them around in and you have a few parts to it. So this is the kettle part itself. Okay so you've got a handle there and you've got a little chain to help pour it. The interesting thing with the Kelly kettle is it looks completely hollow. So that is because the fire pot goes underneath the Kelly kettle and then all the smoke escapes through this hole there um, and that's where the fire, or that's what allows the oxygen to keep accessing the fire and keep it burning. But you do have a thin um, sort of funnel here um, and there is a, a, a section in the Kelly kettle between you know the, the inner hole and the outer part that you can store water in. So you pour it in through the funnel and the entire thing fills with water and because of that huge surface area to the, the heat into the source of the fire it heats up really quickly and then you've got a huge big container full of boiling water for making hot drinks so that's the kettle itself you pot your fire in here so your fire is contained and then it sits on top like that obviously with the chain on the outside 
And there is a hole at the bottom there, again, to allow oxygen to flow into it, but you just have to be careful um, of the, you know, of the fact that there will be potentially flames kind of coming out of that hole. So that's your Kelly kettle there. Now, the third thing that comes with a Kelly kettle is a bung or a cork like this. Now, this bung is solely for keeping water inside the kettle as you're transporting it. You cannot have this bung in the kettle while you are heating water. It's a really, really serious safety concern because if you are heating the water and that bung is in, that pressure will build and build and build inside the kettle to either cause the bung to come off and potentially hit someone or even worse, the kettle itself to explode. So obviously that is a major thing to avoid um, and the easiest way to do it or the only way to avoid that happening is by just keeping this bung out of the kettle. So a couple of other safety things to consider with the Kelly kettle, even though it's an enclosed fire, you do still need to consider um, the same sort of things that you would consider with an open fire. So still have water available to pour on it to keep put it out if you need to. And also this entire thing is metal. So you do have to be very, very careful when handling it. Most of the handles have some sort of fireproof cork over the top um, to allow you to pour them. Um, but we always recommend wearing gloves when you're working with a Kelly kettle. So there we have it, three more really engaging and straightforward activities that you can bring into the outdoors with any age of young people. We had foraging, we had fire lighting, and we had cooking over the fire as well. Now, we really have just scratched the surface with all the potential sessions and activities you could do that relate to bushcraft in the outdoors. Shelter building and crafts are all things that you can weave in um, and do them in the outdoors or can use to bring them into the indoors as well. Shelter building is a really good one and you can make that a kind of, you know, 10 minute session or a half day session really easily, depending on what materials you're using. So you can set the task for young people to use only man or only natural materials that they find in a habitat. So things like sticks and plants to make a good, solid outdoor shelter that they can then all fit inside. And particularly for young students, but for older as well, um, you can really add a, a level of excitement to it by waterproofing or waterproof testing um, there at shelter by maybe pouring a little bucket of water or something over just to see how good it really is. So as well as shelter building, there's some incredible sort of craft and art skills that you can bring in with both young and older students. With younger students, they can, given a bit of time and given a bit of practice, you can do sort of weaving um, and string making with things like our brambles or even nettles as well. Nettles, an incredibly abundant uh, species around different parts of the country. And you can pick them up carefully and make sure you don't get stung or you can just use gloves. And once you roll them between your fingers, that get rid gets rid of all the fine hairs um, that sting you. And then once you've done that, um, if you use guides online, you can make them into string and things like that, which is really fantastic for young people. Other things you can do, other plants you can extract the dye from, things like gorse, and um, they used to be used as dye um, back in the, the olden days. Um, so you could try that and you could maybe dye t-shirts and things and again it's a way to bring the outdoors inside. So for older students as well, it can be really amazing to bring in sort of craftsmanships and wood carving. So if you get particular types of bushcraft knives, they can make some beautiful carvings into wood structures or they can just do woodwork skills themselves and kind of build things that they could maybe take into the outdoors and use for shelters. So leading a session that involves fire and edible plants might sound a little bit daunting, I understand, but I can guarantee you it's a kind of session that is just so, so beneficial for young people that it really is worth the little bit of extra effort um, to try and, you know, run one for yourself. And um, really, really, really regularly, our young people say that the bushcraft is absolutely their favourite activity that they've done, um, and particularly something like fire lighting. If they've managed to light a cotton wool themselves or light a fire themselves and cook a marshmallow over the fire, it is just such a beneficial, worthwhile experience that is amazing for young people and older as well so really really can't recommend enough have a little practice yourself have a little practice with your colleagues you know don't jump into taking students out by yourself for the very first time have a little practice think about how you would manage it and i can guarantee you the benefits will be absolutely worth it
so there we have it, our final engaging and fun activities that you can do in your local outdoor spaces with your young people. Um, so we're just about time for answering questions, but if you do have any still that you'd like to submit, please feel free to add them to the YouTube live chat. You can ask them in there, or you can email them to our email address. That's questions at field-studies-council.org. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but um, first of all, let's talk about some of the... <laughs> sorry about that, folks. Um, so first of all, before we answer any questions, let's have a little talk about some of the online resources um, that you can take advantage of um, facilitating bushcraft learning in the outdoors. Um, so one of the first websites that I'll drive you towards is bushcraftuk.com. Um, it has a range of interesting guides you can use. Um, some of the best ones they have written and they have video guides for some of the skills that we talked about just in that video there. Um, so they have guides to you if you want to refresh your skills on fire lighting, um, but they also have some guides for some of the activities that I just mentioned at the end of the video there. So things like carving um, and woodcraft um, and string making. Um, so if you want to expand on those activities and find a bit more about them, um, you can go to that, that website. So that's bushcraftuk.com. The other one that I'll draw your attention toward is the Woodlands Trust website. Now they've got again a range of resources, but the one in particular that we quite like um, is their foraging page. Um, so they have a lot of different information about some of the um, plants you can use um, to you know, for in the outdoors for foraging for eating. Um, and they also have like a seasonal guide, you know, so they tell you what plants to go for um, at which season. So that's really useful. Now, one of the schemes that I would like to introduce to you guys that is across, you know, the whole um, that is applicable to all the different activities that we've talked about this week, and particularly for these ones today, is the John New Rewards Scheme. So one of the original pioneers for you know getting out into the outdoors and appreciating and conserving our wild spaces was this man, John Muir. Now he was born in Scotland, but was raised in America. And he became the founder for National Parks, all thanks to a very important camping weekend that he took. Um, so he took the then president, Theodore Roosevelt, away camping um, to what is now Yosemite National Park. And just in that few days, Theodore Roosevelt was so fascinated and amazed by the wild places that he saw there that he decided to make Yosemite the first ever national park. And as of course we know now, national parks are present across the entire world. Um, so if it wasn't for that event, you know, we would have these places that protect um, our most beautiful and our most wild locations around the world. Um, so it's massively beneficial for us. Um, and the John Muir Trust is a, uh, is a charity that's been set up in his name to also help conserve and protect these wild spaces. And they've set up a scheme called the John Muir Award and um, that is, idea, uh, is built around young people and getting young people engaged in their local outdoor spaces. And all the activities that we have talked about this week could be put towards the John Muir Awards. So what it is essentially involves is young people going out and exploring a wild place. They have to discover it first of all. They then have to do some activities to explore it. They then have to conserve it. And then finally, they have to share their findings. Um, and it's all in the spirit of adventure, all in the spirit of fun, um, because that's what John Muir was all about. As I said, any of these activities that we've done this week could contribute potentially to the John Muir Award. It's something that you guys could do yourselves with your young people. Um, head on over to the website for more information. Um, but it's a really, really fantastic scheme. It's one that we run here with our young people and across all other FSC centres. Um, and it just allows the young people to really get a sense of achievement for what they've done in the outdoors. And again, be part of something bigger, be part of that bigger picture. Uh, so I think we'll go ahead and do our final questions. Um, so Lorraine, if you'd like to let me know what the questions are. Um, what games and activities can you do around a fire? Okay, so that question was, what games and activities could you potentially do around a fire? Um, now there's an absolutely massive range of activities and I don't want to give away too many um, because we've got a homework task coming up soon. Um, but there's a whole big range. I mean, songs are always the classic go-to. There's loads of campfire songs out there, some of which are really fun. Personally, I'm tone deaf, so I tend to leave the singing to um, the groups that I've got with me. Um, but there's a huge range of songs out there. Um, in terms of activities and games, some of the favourite ones that we do, uh, we love a bit of wink murder. Um, so you've got your circle of kids around a fire. Um, one person is the murderer, one person is the detective. So the detective has to go off and stand, you know, with their eyes closed for a little bit. The murderer then has to try and murder as many people as possible in the circle by winking or blinking at them. Um, and they have to do it, of course, secretly. And then the detective comes along and has to try and guess who the murderer is. That's a really good fun one. 
Uh, we also quite like to do two truths and a lie. Um, we often, that's quite a good one for older students potentially. Um, and it's quite a good way to get to know your young people a little bit more or for them to get to know you as well. You know, they probably don't, you know, they might not think of you or know sometimes about your, your history or past or, you know, things you've done in your life. So it can be quite a good way to, you know, give them a secret little insight to your life. There's a range of other ones as well. Um, we quite like uh, the one word story idea to so we'll go around the circle and then every person has to say one word that then makes a story. And um, it can be a little bit hit or miss, you know, your, your young people need to be committed to it, need to be sensible with it. So maybe slightly older students um, for this one, you do it with young students quite often, the words you just get are poo and bum and things like that, which can make for a very good story. Um, so older people potentially a bit better, um, but that's well, such a huge big range, I don't want to give too many away, I'm sure lots of people have had um, So, cool. next question. What size groups per fire would you suggest for a safe, manageable session? Okay, so that's a good question about health and safety. So that was, what size of group would you do, um, you know, for a, a fire lighting session? What's a safe and manageable number of students? Um, now, this is uh, this is very um, related, I suppose, to what students you are, what students you have going out and about with you. Um, so our student staff ratio that we work with for all of our, well, all of our activities, minus like our adventure activity in the outdoors, we work with one to 30. So that's obviously quite a big number of, you know, uh, uh, staff members to uh, students. And depending on the activity, we will most likely have more um, staff, particularly for something like a fire lighting site. Um, you know, we have done sessions of fire lighting with 30 um, young people, but we've had a lot more staff than just one. We probably had closer to four or five staff members present. So I wouldn't say there's a limit really to the number of people um, that you would run it with. I would just say you need to accommodate the number um, suitable to the number of kind of responsible adults you have. So in terms of how many students you might have working around a fire, I would say somewhere between four to five. Five is probably the maximum. Um, because, you know, five is kind of the, the number where everyone can be doing something. Nobody gets uh, feels left out, um, but you wouldn't really want less than three. Again, it depends a little bit on the number of people. Um, so you need a nice big site, you know, as we saw with our example there for the number of people that you have. Um, and I would try and make sure if you've got young students that are doing it. So let's say young is maybe under 10. You would want at least one uh, responsible adult for number of groups that you have. You know, so you want one of them kind of keeping an eye on that individual group. So if you had you know, let's say, you know, 20 students all split up into groups of five, you would want probably four adults just keep an eye on each thing, um, you know, and kind of work your way up from that. For older students, you can probably trust them a little bit more, um, but just using your own kind of common sense, your own best judgment, um, and using, you know, thinking about your young people particularly, um, and thinking about what they do. Okay. Next question, a final question probably now. Yeah, final question. Have you dealt with or mitigated any situations that may have been close calls? Okay, that's another kind of safety question about um, about fires, in particular, is have you had any close calls um, and how have you mitigated, um, you know, for those situations? So I can honestly say that we we have not had, or personally, I have not had any close calls in terms of fire safety with our young people. Um, and I think that's largely down to the amount of planning and the amount of risk assessment and organising we go into um, for our sessions. So I really cannot emphasize enough how planning really is key, um, you know, when it comes to running these sessions. And I've been working here for about three years um, and I've not had any burns. I've not had any major incidents where I've had to sort of cancel the session um, and come back again. Um, and I, I really think that is just because of our planning. Um, the key thing that I would really emphasize in terms of mitigating, um, you know, for risks and mitigating for um, problems during these sessions is first of all, just have water, have so have you know a couple of buckets of water, have plenty of water present, so that if something does happen when you've got those fires going, you can immediately just get rid of that risk. So the biggest risk, you know, if something behavioural happens, or if, if anything happens um, that's kind of almost external to the fires that happens during your fire lighting session, that fire is immediately your biggest hazard. But it's so simple to get rid of. You just have to you know douse it and get rid of it. And the minute you do that. What you know, what has been a very, very serious issue, just becomes you know a behavioural issue or something you know, else. Needs. So, you know, the, the biggest thing I would say is preparation, and then if you do have any incidents at all, get rid of that fire, and it makes the whole situation much, much more manageable. Okay, so this will be quite a longer session, so we'll finish up there, and that'll be our last question. Um, our very last thing is your homework task for this session. Um, so I've obviously set you guys homework tasks for every single session. This is our very last one that we would like you guys to do. 
So the first part of it is we would like you to go out into your local space um, and try and identify two different edible plants and have a go eating your them yourself or cooking with them or doing something at all. Now, these can't be, you know, your lockdown vegetables that you've been growing or any live herbs that you might have in the garden. You know, these are talking, we're talking wild plants here. So have a little go at looking around for those foraging for them and cooking with them if you can. And then the final um, kind of half to be at homework is we would like you to develop a little half session or a little mock plan for how you would develop an evening session maybe around the fire. What activities would you do and what safety concerns um, would you think about? So I've already given you a few hints there, um, but what would you do for a half sort of campfire session? Okay. So that is us really. Um, that is the end of our of this part of the Be Wild project. Um, really, really, really hope that you guys have enjoyed these sessions and I really hope especially that you have now got loads of ideas for how to use outdoor learning with your young people. I really, really cannot emphasize enough how important outdoor learning and outdoor activities and outdoor experiences for young people are. You know, we have so many students that come to us, you know, before anything happens. Um, in these strange circumstances and they, they benefit from them so much they absolutely love the activities they have such a good time you can see literally just in the space of a few days you can see the confidence growing within young people um, and especially in these weird circumstances that you find yourself in there really is no better time um, to get your young people outside and developing themselves and, and making these long lasting memories so if you do have a go at any of these activities with your young people we would love for you to share them with us um, you know, we would love for you to email them to us. If you're sharing them on social media, make sure you're tagging us in them. We would really, really love to see um, how these sessions have impacted you and impacted your young people. So please do let us know um, if you are doing them with your students. Um, but from this, from us at Millport, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we really hope to see you again soon, actually at our centre in person sometime in the not so distant future. Thank you very much.